Hi, good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Good. It's almost the end of the quarter. I know. We're only going to meet uh, two more times after today. And then, oh, no, we're going to meet Friday, but that'll be a review day. So only have a little bit longer to go over new material. How exciting. Neat. Did you guys sign up for your classes for next term already? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be here. So oh. I might be recovering from surgery. So. Oh, that's right. That's next Tuesday, right? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll be thinking of you and sending you all the luck, okay? Okay. All right. All right. So what I thought we'd do today is I'd like to get started with a little warm-up um, to review what we learned yesterday, which was um, the shape, strength, the trend, and also the context. So... I'm going to share my screen with you guys. There it is. So what this graph is, is it's the year, so starting around 1912, going all the way up to 2008. And we're looking at the times for a woman's race in the Olympics. So what I'd like you guys to do is just draw a quick sketch of this doesn't have to be exact and I want you to just in single words tell me what the strength the shape and the trend of this graph is so go ahead and take a minute or two to write that down okay and then just give me a little hand wave when you're done Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Aiden. Thanks, Talia. So we're looking at this graph and we just want to know the trend, the shape, and the strength. So uh, Evan, I want you to tell me what the shape of this graph is. Uh, linear. Linear? Okay. And what did you think the strength was? Do you think it was strong or weak or moderate? I thought it was pretty strong. Okay, good. All right. So, Talia. Yes. What did you say the shape of this graph was? Uh, I said it was like a negative trend. Negative trend? Good. Did you think that the shape was linear or nonlinear? Uh, nonlinear, sorry. <laughs> nonlinear? Okay, cool. So, Looking at this graph, we definitely have a negative trend. So we know it's negative because if we go from left to right, we can see that it's going down. So as the years increase, we can see that the time for these um, female racers is decreasing. So that means that they're getting faster. If we look at the shape, it looks like if I follow it with my mouse like this, 
it looks like it's got a little bit of a curve to it. So I would say that the shape was more nonlinear. So for that warm up, I would say that this was nonlinear, very strong correlation because the shapes look like they're, or the dots look like they're pretty close together and they make a definite shape and a negative trend. So good job on that one, guys. I can definitely see how we would perceive it as um, slightly linear, but that little curve at the bottom makes me think it's nonlinear. Uh, for the past few Olympics, are they following the same trend? Yeah. Like the 2016, 2020? Mm -hmm. Are they bottoming out? Is it like getting to its fastest time, basically? Right. So like Olympic athletes are starting to get as fast as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. I like that you noticed that for sure. It'd be weird if we just kept getting like faster and faster and faster. Did you know that the fastest um, animal on Earth can reach speeds of 220 miles per hour? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that a hawk? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so hawks, when they're uh, free diving to get prey, yeah. they can reach up to 220 miles per hour. It's cool. It is cool. Also, I feel like it shouldn't count because it's falling. Like, I'm like, you're not, like, you're not making any effort, but I guess if you're falling and then you can recover and not die, I guess that counts. But the fastest animal that um, creates its own speed is a um, sailfish. They can go up to 68 miles per hour in the water. I know all this because my daughter asked me what the fastest animal on earth was. So of course I had to Google it and we had a nice talk about it. All right, so today what we are going to be talking about is we are going to be talking about something really cool. So we're in unit nine and we're gonna be talking about something called the correlation coefficient. So what this correlation coefficient does is it is going to tell us two things. It's going to tell us the strength of the linear relationship between our two variables, x and y, and the trend. So this correlation coefficient is going to tell us the strength of the linear relationship between x and y, and it's also going to tell us something about the trend. So whether these um, two variables are related in a positive or in a negative way. Now, there's two key things here. The key thing that I want you guys to underline and remember is that it's going to tell you the strength of the linear relationship. So in this course, we're only going to be using the correlation coefficient to talk about the linear relationship. So if something doesn't look like a straight line, maybe it looks more parabolic, so like a curve like this or something like this, and then we wouldn't use the correlation coefficient to determine the strength. The other thing is that it's also going to be telling us the trend. So does this look like it has a positive trend? Does this look like it has a negative trend? So. Here is what the correlation coefficient um, <clears throat> is, is the correlation coefficient is going to be denoted by The letter R.
So whenever a program, a book, something like that is going to tell you what the correlation coefficient is, it's going to say R equals something. Now, R is going to be a number, and here's how that number R is going to work. is that r is going to be some number between negative 1 and positive 1. And if our r is closer to negative 1 or closer to positive 1, that means that we're going to have a strong correlation between these two. Now, if it's closer to zero, the closer to zero it is, we're going to have a weak correlation. So just to give us a little bit of an idea, a strong linear correlation would be something like this, so something that makes a pretty straight line and it's also negative, so it's going down. Something with a strong positive correlation Would be something like this where it's going up. And then some examples of weak correlations on either side. If we had a weak negative correlation, We would see something like this where our dots are a lot more scattered, not close together, but we can still kind of see that we have a trend going down. And likewise, if we have a weak positive correlation, we would see something like this where we still see a correlation, but our parts are still spread pretty far apart. Remember that vertical variation that we talked about yesterday? So if we look at these dots vertically, we can see that there's quite a bit of space and dots in between all of them. So this is pretty cool because now what this means is that we're actually going to get a number to talk about the strength of a relationship. Now, the reason that this is so great is because it's good to be able to look at a graph and say, hey, this is a strong correlation, hey, this is a weak correlation, but this is going to be really great because it's going to give us a definite number, and also what we're going to see, not tomorrow, but the next day, is how we can use that number in conjunction with our graph to maybe pick some data and throw it away because it's kind of skewing our results a little bit. All right, so before we move on, are you guys okay if I move that? If anybody wants it back, just uh, unmute your mic and let me know. So I wanted to show you guys this page in your textbook. This is in the AHSS textbook, which is the first link on the reading in the unit. And what it does is that it gives you this 
nice image which kind of helps you to estimate what you think the R might be. So here we have a perfectly straight positive trend, so it's going to have an R value of 1. As you can see, as these dots get more spread out, so they get more variation, our R starts to go down. So here we have a little bit of variation, so the R is 0.98. Here our R is 0.69, so we get a little bit more spread out. And the more spread out our dots become, the smaller our R gets. And then here we have an R of negative 0 0.08, so there's a slightly negative trend but I would say that there's no trend like that, just looks a paint splatter to me. But as our dots get closer together and start to form a negative trend, that is when your R is going to switch to a negative value. Yeah. Cool. So the next thing I'm going to talk to you guys about is how do we find R? So when it comes to finding R, it's this really long, laborious process where you have to use the average of both of your variables, the standard deviation of both of your variables, and then you have to do these long, exhaustive calculations. Like, seriously, I'm a mathematician, and it takes me 15 minutes to find R by hand. So how do we find R? We're going to use technology. So I'm going to show you guys how we can use technology to find R. So if you would, on your computer, go ahead and go to Unit 9. And scroll down to where it says technology and we're going to go ahead and we're going to go and open Desmos all right so give me a little sign when you are there so I know that I can move on I don't want to fly ahead of you guys and leave you in the dust So if you open up that website, it's automatically going to have the linear equation, which we'll get to next time, but it's also going to have your R right here. So we can see our R value down here at the bottom, R equals negative 0.982. It's also going to give you your um, slope and the y-intercept for a line that can fit your data. So what you, all you have to do is just type your values into here. So if we wanted to type our values in from the last problem, we could do 1912 and we can do 82.2, 1924 and 72.4, 1932, 66.8, and let's just do one more. Let's do 1952 and 66.8. Okay, now here's something that can be a little bit alarming is when you type those numbers in, you don't see them on the graph here. Now, that's not that big of a deal. The reason that we don't see them on the graph here is because our graph only goes from 0 to 16 on the x-axis and 0 to 10 on the y-axis. Notice that our x here goes from 1912 to 1952, and our y values go from 82 to 66. So what I'd like to do so that I can actually see my graph is click here on that little wrench. Then I'd like to change my x values so they actually reflect the x values that I have. So I'm going to go between 19 10, so a little bit lower, and let's go to 1950, or no, 1960, so a little bit higher, 
And for my y-axis, let's go from 60 to 90. So I always like to go a little bit higher than my highest value and a little bit lower than my lowest value, just so I can make sure I get everything in the picture. So here this is, and I have my R value of negative 0.8484, which is pretty cool. Another thing that you guys can do is if you have a lot of data, so this isn't that much, but let's say I didn't want to enter all of these dates in by hand. You can copy the data. Okay, and then you can just click on the Desmos app and hit Control V. And it will put that data in there for you. The key thing to note when you do this is that when I pasted it in, notice that it made this an X2 and a Y2, but down here it has Y1 and X1. So we just want to click on that and change that to an X1. I want to change that to a Y1. And then we're going to get our correlation coefficient right down here. So negative 0.9512, which is pretty cool. The other thing that's really neat about doing this online is that if you put in something called an outlier, so let's say that we put a point in here that was really high up, what the program's going to automatically do is that it's going to calculate that into your R and also into trying to fit a line that goes through your data, and you can see in real time how that's going to mess it up. So let's say for some reason in 2010 we had somebody who won the Olympics, but everybody was quite a bit slower that year than they had been before. So let's say that their finishing time was like 79.4. Okay, so they're way up here. What we can see is we can see that that outlier is going to affect our correlation coefficient. So it went from being negative 0.98, which was pretty high, all the way down to negative 0.5589. So this is one of those examples where you look at a graph and you're like, well, the relationship looks like it's actually pretty strong. So why is my correlation coefficient so low? And the reason it's so low is because that outlier is skewing our data. So the best thing to do when you have an outlier is to note that it exists and then to remove it. All right. So I'm going to give you guys some data. Uh, and, what is the oh, point of the R squared? Oh, we're going to get to that. Do? Okay. Yeah. Actually, I can just tell you guys right now. It's like the coolest thing on the planet. Other than me. I'm the coolest thing on the planet, but it's pretty close. So what, <laughs> what R squared is, is that R squared uses R. And here's, I just, this blows my mind. I just think it's the coolest, like, it's one of those things where you're like, that's not true, but it totally is. So if you take your correlation coefficient and you square it, you're always going to get a positive number. And that positive number is always going to be between 0 and 1. Now, that's not that cool. The cool part is that this is telling you how much of your data is actually close to your line. So this R squared is telling you, hey, only 31% of your data is actually close to this line. The rest of it is too far away to make a accurate prediction. So that's what R squared is. So I was going to get to that later, but it just blows my mind that you, they're like, how much of our data is close to the line? And like, I don't know, what if we square the number? And they're like, holy crap, that gives you the percentage of your data that's close to the line. So anywho. I'm going to give you guys some data and I'm going to have you enter it in and I want you to tell me, whoops, my apologies. I want you to tell me what the R squared is and if you think that you should actually, or the R and tell me if you think that we should actually use R to describe the relationship of that line. So. Here is what we are going to be looking at. Go. So we're going to be looking at
birth year and life expectancy. So we're going to have 1930, 1940, 1965, 1973, 1992, and 2010, and the following life expectancies. So 59.7, and 78.7. Uh, I also put the website where I'm pulling this data into the chat. So in case you don't want to write it down and you would rather just copy and paste it from that table, totally fine. So what I would like you guys to do is I would like you to use that Desmos calculator and tell me what the correlation coefficient is and if you think it does a good job. By the way, like usual, if you guys could throw up a uh, emoji or type in the chat when you are finished, that would be cool. Absolutely no rush. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Hayden. All right. So, Hayden, what did you get for your R value? I got an R value of nine six or point nine six one three. All right. Positive or negative? Positive. All right. Cool. So, just looking at the data that we have here, that makes sense to me because 
as the year increases, we can see that life expectancy is going to also increase. So that makes good sense to me that we have a positive R. If for some reason the life expectancy was decreasing as the year increased, then I would expect a negative R. So I'm going to go ahead and take this data. I'm not going to copy the words. I'm just going to copy the numbers. So right click and copy. I'm going to go here. I'm going to paste that in. And before I change the subscripts on my X and my Y, I'm just going to look at this. And I'm going to note that like it looks like it's actually pretty good. Look like I have a jump in life expectancy during the 50s and then it calms down a little bit. <clears throat> and continues to increase. So just by looking at this, I would expect to have a pretty strong R. So something between 0.8 or 0.9. It takes a lot of practice looking at graphs to be able to estimate the R value. But if I got an R value of 0.5, that seems pretty weak to me. So I would not expect that. So I'm going to go ahead and change these subscripts to be X1 and Y1. And what I see is that I get an R of 0 0.96. So did anybody get anything different or does that look pretty good to you guys? Mine was like a tiny bit different, but I probably just typed something in wrong or something. Yeah, but it was 0.9517, so. Oh, good, nice. So the thing that we're going to get into next time, which we're not going to get into a lot today, is that we're actually going to end up using this R value to find an equation to kind of fit a straight line to our data as best as we can. Now, the reason that we want to do that is because we have all this known data, but it'd be nice if we had a line so that we could estimate unknown data. So if we're looking at this line that Desmos made for us, <clears throat> maybe we don't have the data for say 1945. So if we look at our list of data here, we only have data between 1940 and 1950. What I could do is that I could use this line to try to estimate, hey, what was the life expectancy around 1945? I'm like, oh, it was probably around 65 years old. Right, or I could say, hey, what was the life expectancy in the year 2000? And I could look at my line and say, oh, in the year 2000, the life expectancy was probably around 77.7 .7 years. I assume for estimating, you want to stay at least somewhat close to your data. Like, because if you follow the trend in 1660, the life expectancy was zero. Yeah, so you want to stay within the bounds of your data when you're trying to make an estimation because you don't know if that trend will change. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> um, Hayden brought up a great point, which is if you're trying to make a prediction off your line, you need to stay within the data that you know. So if you go outside of it, what you're assuming is that you're assuming that that trend's going to continue and you're going to get unrealistic expectations. So for example, if we looked at say the year 2021, we'd be like, oh, the average life expectancy is 105 years. And you're like, well, that seems pretty high. Like I, I expect it to continue to go up, but 105 seems unrealistic. You're also making assumptions that you know what's gonna happen. Also, if you go backwards and you look at say 1830, like, oh, the life expectancy was 39 years old. Now, I know the life expectancy in the 1830s was low, but I doubt it was that low. Okay. So it's a very important thing that we're going to talk about um, tomorrow is stay within your lines when you are um, trying to estimate data. All right. So the last thing that we are going to do is I want you guys to just draw a rough, or rough 
sketches of the following. Okay. All right, so when you guys are done sketching out those scatter plots, go ahead and give me a sign. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good. So for each one of these, <clears throat> I want you guys to note two different things. I want you to note the strength the trend. And I also want you to estimate R. So I want you to do that for all three of these things. So tell me what the strength is, the trend, and I also want you to give me an estimation of what you think the R value is. So I'm going to split you guys up into two groups. Okay, and I just want you guys to talk about that for like five minutes and then we'll come back together and summarize. So the strength, the trend, and the R value. So breakout rooms. All right, so go for it. So five minutes. So if you want to do um, regression in Excel, you go up to data. And then if you go all the way to the right hand side, you should see data analysis. You might have to add that in if you go to YouTube and type in adding data analysis to Excel, there's a little video there. So you click, click data analysis and when you scroll down, you'll get to regression and you'll hit OK. And it'll ask you to input your Y range. So when you do the Y range, you're just going to highlight your data. That would be one of your values for your X range right here. You're just going to highlight the data that would be your X values. And then you hit line fit plots and you hit OK. And what that will do is it will give you a nice little graph right here of your data. And then it will also give you your R right here. It'll give you R squared. Okay, and it'll give you a lot of extra information that you don't need. Personally, I like to use Desmos because it actually gives you a nicer line and you can change it in real time and it's just a little bit easier of a output to read. But just in case some of you are really into um, using Excel, that is there for you. So what we're going to talk about next time is we're going to talk about how do you fit a line to your data? Where does it come from? And how can you use it? And most importantly, how to not use it. So that is all I have for you guys today.
day. I will see you early tomorrow morning. And remember, we only have three more classmates before the final exam. So I will see you guys later. Have a good one. Thank you.